And welcome everybody to uh, this live book event here presented by the Progressive Magazine and a room of one's own bookstore. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight and thanks so much to room of one's own bookstore for hosting this event. If you uh, want to buy a copy of the book that you're going to be hearing about tonight, you can go to their website roomofonesown.com and you can order a book there and when all the orders get in John has offered to go down to the bookstore and uh, sign them in a socially distanced sort of way uh, and I'm sure he'll be wearing his uh, progressive magazine uh, face mask as well when he goes there so make sure to uh, order your progressive magazine face mask uh, from our website at progressive.org slash gifts well Thank you so much again for joining us. It's really a pleasure to uh, be able to present this event tonight. And um, particularly for me, I'll talk a little bit about that in just a second, but I do want to uh, share before we get started a little bit of video of the man that we'll be talking about this evening. Uh, Henry Wallace was the vice president of the United States of America. And in 1942, he gave a speech called The Century of the Common Man, and we're going to hear a little bit of that uh, recording right now. In the march of freedom of the past 150 years has been a long, drawn-out people's revolution. In this great revolution of the people there were the American Revolution of 17... And I think we're back again live. Sorry about the interruption there. It was uh, too much too much technology for the uh, for the computer here. I apologize for that. Welcome back again to our uh, live book event. And uh, you know, I want to say uh, I'm sorry that you missed that clip of Henry Wallace that caused the computer to crash because it really is uh, an inspiring speech. I urge you to, to check it out. You know, for me, I come to this, uh, I come to this event naturally, I think, because um, my parents were both Henry Wallace supporters. They had a friend who traveled on the uh, Henry Wallace caravan, which was the first interracial cultural performances in uh, the modern segregated South. Um, I also lived near uh, Curtis McDougall, who was the author of the three volume uh, history of the Henry Wallace campaign, uh, Gideon's Army, that uh, I know John is very familiar with. And in fact, in 1998, John and I had uh, briefly talked about the idea of retracing the trail of the Henry Wallace caravan for the 50th anniversary. That never happened, but uh, I'm so glad that uh, John has uh, written this book, um, which really is a book uh, whose time has come. Uh, let's uh, give a very warm welcome to John Nichols, author of The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party. Norm, it's good to be with you. And, and thanks to everyone who's joined in. I don't know how many folks are in because uh, we don't actually have a, a, a charting of that on here. but. Uh, I, I hope there's a good number. It looks maybe about uh, several dozen, maybe about 35, 36. Um, and I appreciate all of you for coming out on a December night. Uh, it's a little bit easier than coming to a bookstore in some ways, although I have to be honest, I'd prefer the human scale and the, and the human touch. Uh, and I hope that we'll be back doing that again soon. In the meantime, uh, let me just say up front, thanks so much to the Progressive Magazine for organizing this and for, to Norm especially for the good work that he's done. Uh, thanks also to A Room of One's Own, which is just a treasure. It's a fan, fabulous independent bookseller here in Madison. And I really wanna to emphasize to folks, I mean, I certainly hope you'll uh, buy copies of my book, uh, but if you are inclined to buy any book tonight, uh, I hope you'll do it through A Room of One's Own. This is a, a challenging time for independent booksellers because of COVID-19 and the economic uh, turbulence that is extended from it. 
And we want to make sure that the institutions that sustain our communities survive it. And the way we can do that is by supporting them in this time. I think bookstores are absolutely essential, uh, not just to a, a sense of community, but really to radical life uh, in the, the towns where we live. And Room of One's Own has, has served that uh, purpose for a very long time. I've done many of my readings uh, in what is now the Room of One's Own uh, storefront or store, and I hope to be back there soon. Uh, in the meantime, though, let's talk about Henry Wallace. And uh, Henry Wallace is an, an epic figure in American history and a, a part of why I wrote this book, but not the whole of it. Uh, and I'll explain uh, by stepping back one degree and telling you why I, why I wrote this book at this time. As some folks may know, I've written a lot of books about American politics, and uh, I've tried to explore subjects that are not always uh, examined by our mainstream media and by even a lot of mainstream authors. And so I've looked a lot at, uh, frankly, the left of American politics. I wrote a book about a decade ago on socialism, uh, the S word. I've also written books on uh, the power of impeachment and holding presidents to account as well as a number of books with Bob McChesney on media and democracy. Uh, when I started thinking about this book, it, it began really with my publisher, Andy Shaw, who is a, um, oh, I'm told by Norm we might have crashed again. I hope not. Um, I'm going to keep trying to uh, talk to folks and see if, if they can hear me. Um, so my publisher, Andy Shaw, uh, reached out to me uh, right after the election of uh, Donald Trump in 2016. And Andy wanted to know if, if I wanted to do a book on, on how Trump got elected. And it seemed to me that the way to do that was to write about uh, the Republican Party and the, the party that had made it possible uh, for, I'm, I'm glad I just got a note from someone who said, I'm still live here, so I'm gonna keep going uh, Norm may be having some challenges with his computer and, and great regard to him for all of his efforts here, uh, but we'll keep talking. And if, uh, if our good uh, viewers let me know if there's a challenge, um, I will uh, we'll address it as we go along. This is the moment we live in. Um, so anyways, Andy Shaw said to me that uh, he'd like a book uh, and I'm always, always happy to respond to publishers uh, entreaties of that sort. But uh, I did think initially that I'd write about the Republican Party and about the decline of the Republican Party from the party that was founded in Wisconsin in 1854 by radicals, by uh, abolitionists, land reformers, and socialists, uh, and really was the most radical uh, intervention politically of its moment and uh, had degenerated into a party that would produce a billionaire or a faux billionaire president uh, named Donald Trump. But as I examined the Republican Party more and more, I came to the conclusion that the challenge was not the Republican Party and its decline. The real challenge was within the Democratic Party. And it wasn't to be uh, overly rough on the Democratic Party or to focus on it in some sort of obsessive way, but rather because of a, a question that needed to be answered. And that was, how could the Democratic Party lose to people like Donald Trump? How could it lose to someone like George W. Bush? How could it lose to Ronald Reagan, to Richard Nixon? What was it about a, a Democratic Party, a party uh, conceptually, seemingly, uh, with some decent policies, a party more in touch with uh, hopefully the working class, with a vision of uh, justice for the broad majority of people, do so badly politically? that it would produce a steady stream of increasingly uh, right-wing election results, not by choice, but by, by reality. And it seemed to me that, that um, it had a lot to do with the embrace of neoliberalism, uh, the sort of more conservative approach to governance that uh, has really infected the Democratic Party uh, since Jimmy Carter's presidency and become more and more uh, a presence within the party on economic issues especially um, particularly under Bill Clinton. And, and it seemed to me that, that an examination of the Democratic Party was where we might get to some answers about how uh, our politics had degenerated to the point that it had gotten to. 
And, and so then the question was, well, where did the Democratic Party go off the rails? Where did the party of Franklin Roosevelt, which had redefined American politics and redefined American policymaking in the 1930s and 1940s, end up um, as the party that dismantled much of what Roosevelt did, uh, taking apart Glass-Steagall and the regulatory state under Bill Clinton, moving away from uh, the combative, aggressive politics of FDR and, and those around him toward the softer, more compromising politics that we saw in the 90s, the 2000s, even the, the 2010s, a, po a politics that was insufficient to maintain the majorities of Democratic presidents elected, often with uh, widespread support, but then in short order disempowered by midterm elections. And, and as I looked back, it, it came into focus, really, that the point at which the Democratic Party sort of lost its fight, lost its, its energy, was in the um, 1940s, at the end of Roosevelt's life, or toward the end of Roosevelt's life, when the party rejected um, its Roosevelt's most activist and engaged, most New Deal affirming vice president, and that was Henry Wallace. And, and so I began to look at Wallace as a, as a touchstone. And really, the examination of Wallace forms the first half of this book. The second half of this book um, looks at how the party uh, extended from the 1940s into the present day um, and had a great battle, as I suggest in the title, for the soul of the Democratic Party, a battle between centrist and more conservative forces and a left that sought to advance economic and social and racial justice uh, to care for the planet and to readjust budget priorities so that instead of supporting a military industrial complex, uh, there was a strong support for um, human needs. And Um, if folks can hear me, and I'm not sure they can, I think maybe they can. We've lost uh, a lot of our of our participants here, um, and uh, and so I think we're back in. Uh, and so I'll try and uh, try and and read this little passage. It looks like we may not, uh, we might not work out tonight. Um, it's uh, we've had a a bit of a disastrous time here with technology, but um, not the first time in in this moment. So I'm going to uh, begin again. I'm reading a little section from the book. Uh, in what I had, the, the setup for this section of the book uh, is that uh, Roosevelt, 1940, asked Henry Wallace, his Secretary of Agriculture, to serve as his Vice President. Uh, their uh, service, their their tenure, coincided with World War II, um, and that was a very obviously challenging time for the country. And one of the things that Wallace sought to do, in addition to advancing the uh, war effort, uh, was to maintain the New Deal, to maintain this energetic sense of possibility, this vision for trying to advance economic and social, and in Wallace's view, especially racial justice, uh, as well as a, a vision for the post-war period uh, in which the New Deal would be renewed and uh, seek to address the fundamental challenges facing the country. Um, so a section from the book. Uh, from the mid-1940s onward, Wallace was prepared the, to name the enemies of human progress. He shared Paul Robeson's view that the danger for the United States in the post-war era lay in the resurgent imperialist and pro-fascist forces in our country. That's a quote from Wallace. Uh, as the second highest ranking official in the country, he did not hesitate to make the appropriate yet too rarely spoken connection between Hitler's preachments about racial purity and the language of Southern segregationists who also spoke of a master race. For Wallace, a breaking point came in the summer of 1943 after racial violence flared in Detroit, leaving 34 dead, including 17 African-Americans at the hands of the police. Wallace traveled to the city and addressed a mass meeting of labor and civil rights organizations. Quote, we cannot fight to crush Nazi brutality abroad and condone race riots at home, he told the crowd. Those who, flame, who fan the fires of racial clashes for the purpose of making political capital here at home are taking the first step toward Nazism. Wallace warned, there are powerful groups who hope to take advantage of the president's concentration on the war effort to destroy everything he has accomplished on the domestic front over the last 10 years. Some people call these powerful groups isolationists. 
Others call them reactionaries, and still others, seeing them following in European footsteps, call them American fascists. Those were dark, jarring words from the Vice President of the United States, but Henry Wallace chose them carefully, starting when he and was Roosevelt's Secretary of Agriculture, Wallace studied foreign languages so that he could speak directly with the leaders and planners of the fight against Hitler and the Axis. He traveled widely and consulted often with those who had resisted the rise of fascism in Europe and who were resisting its pull in Latin America and Asia. He made a study of the threat and he intended to speak about it in an American context. He proposed a broad definition of this charged term that would apply to the racist, warmongers, and monopolists who manipulated media and politics to maintain their grip on America. Speaking to that 1943 mass meeting in one of the nation's great industrial centers, Wallace warned that the people of America know that the second step toward fascism is the destruction of labor unions. There are midget Hitlers here who continually attack labor. There are other demagogues blind to the errors of every other group who shout, we love labor, but both the midget Hitlers and the demagogues are enemies of America. Both would destroy labor unions if they could. Labor should be fully aware of its friends and of its enemies. Wallace ripped into industrialists saying, we know that imperialist freebooters using the United States as a base can make another war inevitable. He warned that too many corporations have made money by holding inventions out of use, by holding up prices, and by cutting down production. Could the schemes of midget Hitlers, the imperialist freebooters, the American fascists be stopped? Wallace said, shouldering our responsibilities for enlightenment, abundant production, and world cooperation, we can begin now our apprenticeship to world peace. Wallace said, there will be heartbreaking delays. There will be prejudices creeping in and faint-hearted, the faint-hearted will spread their whispers of doubt, but nothing will prevail against the common man's peace in a common man's world as he fights both for free enterprise and full employment. The world, pledged Henry Wallace, is one family with one future, a future which will bind our brotherhood with heart and mind and not with chains. Henry Wallace in 1943. That language, uh, which uh, in many ways echoes uh, some of the language you might have heard from uh, folks in the current era, uh, uh, Bernie Sanders and AOC and Ilhan Omar, uh, was too radical for many in the Democratic Party in 1943. And uh, there was an immediate effort to push back against Wallace, the segregationists, the moneyed interests, the corporatists, as well as much of the media, including the New York Times, began to attack him for using the term American fascist to refer to segregationists, racists, uh, corporatists. And in 1944, there was a huge effort to displace Wallace from the ticket. It proved to be successful. He was forced off the ticket at a contested convention in Chicago. Uh, he remained loyal to Roosevelt, remained a part of the administration, but was ultimately forced out by Roosevelt's successor, Harry Truman. Uh, over the ensuing years, Wall Wallace kept, sought to keep alive uh, the vision of the New Deal and its promise with an emphasis on peace and economic and social and racial justice. Ultimately, uh, he ran against Truman in 48, was unsuccessful, and was marginalized by the Democrats. Uh, it's at that point in the book, having told the story of Wallace's uh, rise and, uh, and his fall, uh, that I began to look at, uh, at the struggles that extended from him and uh, with close examinations of uh, George McGovern's battle for the presidency in 1972, where he won the Democratic nomination, but was then opposed by a group called Democrats for Nixon, which included many of the most prominent and powerful governors, senators, and others. Uh, in that case, the Democratic leadership, not all of it, but much of it, turning against McGovern to disempower him, disempower his coalition, and defeat him. Uh, a somewhat untold story of, of why McGovern was not as successful as he might have been. Then go on to examine the rise of uh, Michael Harrington and Democratic Socialists of America and other groups that fought to move the party to the left. Uh, their great successes in the 1970s, but then the pushback against them by the Democratic Leadership Council and neoliberal groups that uh, marshaled corporate money and uh, billionaire power 
to try and move into the Democratic Party and move it far to the right on, again, the issues of economic and social and racial justice. Examine the Clinton administration, examine the Bush era, the Obama administration, and then come into the current, current moment. Uh, in the book, I write a lot about uh, the people who have risen in the last few years to try and reclaim that vision of economic and social and racial justice within the Democratic Party and their battles. I close the book uh, by traveling to Henry Wallace's home uh, or birthplace in Orient Township, Iowa with Bernie Sanders in the summer of 2019. Uh, Sanders and I walked the fields that Wallace walked as a, as a young man uh, and talked a lot about the loss of that New Deal spirit as well as uh, the, the efforts to reclaim Roosevelt's vision of an economic bill of rights. I close the book off, the final pages of the book, uh, with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in Detroit. Uh, we were there in this, again in the summer of uh, 2018 uh, when she had just uh, defeated a Democratic member of Congress and was uh, rising into the, the public consciousness as uh, a far more uh, emboldened and, and radical uh, voice for a Democratic Party that embraced many of the um, uh, values and ideals of uh, the left, and particularly of Henry Wallace and, and Franklin Roosevelt. AOC is a, is a good scholar of history. And so uh, as we sat and talked, uh, not many blocks away from where Wallace gave that speech that I read from a few minutes ago, uh, we did talk a lot about FDR, and she talked about uh, recognizing the imperfections of, of the Roosevelt administration, its failures and, and weaknesses, but also the strength of its uh, vision and its efforts to try and uh, create a politics that responded to the needs of the great mass of Americans and that responded to critical fundamental challenges. And uh, at the close of our conversation, she talked a lot about uh, what Roosevelt tried to accomplish, what the New Deal um, tried to accomplish. And uh, she, we were standing in a parking lot and just outside of a, of a restaurant, uh, just outside of Detroit. And um, she, we were standing there and uh, I'll close off just with this final uh, section. Beaming now filled with energy and excitement, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez spoke of forging a party that would again extend from the bottom up that would be first and foremost accountable to working class people again and to marginalized people. She looked up toward the North Star above the great American city of Detroit and said, I don't want that to be something that we just talk about, something that is in our past. I want it to be something that we are about, she said. I want to be that party again. Um, and that is my story of the fight for the soul of the Democratic Party, an ongoing battle. And if we're working, uh, technologically at this point, and if our great, uh, now so many of our viewers who've stuck with us, and I truly appreciate that, I think we've, we've got a actually a rather large crowd here with us, um, we could go to some questions, and so Norm, I invite you back in. Yep, I'm, uh, I'm here, John, and thank you so, so very much for doing this. I apologize for the technical difficulties. We did test all this earlier today, so um, uh, the, the technology gods were not with us. But um, if people want to type their questions into the chat, either on Facebook or YouTube, we have uh, people monitoring both of those live streams, and they'll pass those questions on to me. But let me start, John, by talking about some of the people that you mentioned in the book that were influenced by Henry Wallace. Uh, many of them not surprising. I mean, you mentioned George McGovern, uh, who had worked for Wallace as a as a young man. Um, also, Noam Chomsky. Yeah, I could talk. I'd be glad to talk about some of them. Um, yeah. Uh, it is true that McGovern was a delegate to the Progressive Party Convention in 1948 and uh, was actually very enthusiastic about uh, Henry Wallace's candidacy and remained so. Uh, in his last years, I interviewed McGovern about Wallace and others, and uh, uh, it's notable that uh, as he got to be older, McGovern spoke a lot about uh, the, the influence and the value of Wallace's campaigning and in fact, dedicated the Henry Wallace Reading Room at the Department of Agriculture. Uh, you also mentioned or asked about Noam Chomsky. I interviewed Chomsky for the book, uh, and uh, Chomsky told a wonderful story that as a uh, roughly 15-year-old or a teenager, 
Um, he was a very enthusiastic Henry Wallace backer. Um, and uh, as a Jewish kid living in the Philadelphia area, uh, he was a linguist already is, and uh, very excited about learning foreign languages. And he felt that one of the useful things he could do was to translate Wallace's campaign literature uh, into uh, Arabic, which he did, um, producing an Arabic leaflet for Henry Wallace that I'm, I'm not sure was, was totally essential to the campaign, but, but a, a part of the contribution. Uh, there are so many other people that were involved. Uh, Coretta Scott, young Coretta Scott, who had become Coretta Scott King, uh, attended the uh, Progressive Party convention in 1948. Um, Betty Friedan uh, was a active campaigner for Henry Wallace, an enthusiastic uh, supporter of, of what he did. Uh, but these were young people, uh, very young. And of course, one of his most active campaigners was a young, uh, uh, young historian named Howard Zinn, uh, who campaigned very aggressively across uh, in the New York area for him. Um, but his, his most essential backers in, in uh, the 1940s uh, were obviously older folks. Um, and uh, he was very, very close to Paul Robeson, the, the great uh, actor, singer, thinker, political activist, and Robeson would campaign with him uh, throughout the South and, and in, at many events. Uh, among the other people who were very big Henry Wallace backers, especially as he battled um, in the late 1940s, were Albert Einstein, uh, who is, a, a, it's fair to say, a friend of Wallace's and a champion of, of uh, much of what he did. And uh, for Wisconsinites, perhaps a good reference point, Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright corresponded with Wallace and uh, sent him a letter saying that everyone at Taliesin was cheering him on as, as he battled initially for the soul of the Democratic Party and then having left the Democratic Party as an independent progressive, uh, trying to advance uh, many of the visions and, and ideals that were associated with the New Deal. So Wallace, Wallace did indeed inspire a lot of people. Uh, you mentioned another one too, that was, I thought was interesting, a, a young uh, songwriter. Oh, Pete Seeger. No. Leonard oh, Cohen. Leonard Cohen, yes, of course. Leonard Cohen. <laughs> uh, well, Pete Seeger campaigned with yes. Wallace. Uh, yeah, Pete Seeger, of course, was part of the part of the caravan with with Robeson, with Studs Terkel as the MC, Ronnie yep. Gilbert of the Weavers. Uh, yep. Yep. Very remarkable, uh, remarkable politics in those days. Um, influenced by uh, the whole of the left. I mean, there was no question that Wallace accepted support from the Communist Party in 1948, though he was. Uh, in fact, quite a capital, an enlightened capitalist. Um, uh, but there were there were all sorts of, of folks who became associated with it and inspired by it. And one of the songs uh, that he liked the best, one of his favorite songs, was uh, a song called "Passing Through," which had been written by uh, actually a guy who eventually became a professor at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. And "Passing Through" uh, included the lines. I was at Franklin Roosevelt's side on the night before he died. Um, he said, one world must come out of World War II. Yankee, Russian, black or tan, you know, a man is still a man. We're all on one road and we're only passing through. Wallace loved that song, uh, that notion of, of re renewing and extending the New Deal. So uh, Seeger would sing it quite often uh, uh, at campaign events. And then when they were just on their own, in the South, when they campaigned in 1948, uh, they were refused to eat at restaurants that did not serve African Americans. They also refused to stay in hotels that did not uh, allow African Americans to stay there. So they were they were actually very limited in, in where they could uh, eat and stay. Often stayed uh, with friends and comrades, um, and uh, and so the music was a big part of it. They they would uh, they they embraced it very warmly. Um, uh, and they did uh, contribute to the book People's Songs, which a young fellow up in uh, at a socialist summer camp in uh, Canada named Leonard Cohen uh, memorized. And Cohen did indeed continue to sing the song Passing Through um, almost to the end of his life. Uh, it was a centerpiece of many of his concerts. And uh, I got to see him sing it a number of times over the years and uh, often thought of uh, Pete Seeger's contribution and, and that that long extended connection to Henry Wallace. Yeah. So um, 
a couple of questions that are coming in. One um, is what was Henry Wallace's stand on the Japanese internment camps and uh, mm -hmm. did that create a conflict with uh, Roosevelt, his president? Yeah, I write about it in the book at, at some length. Um, Wallace didn't do enough. Uh, he was vice president at the time. Uh, there, it's, it's pretty clear that he was uncomfortable with it, but I'm not gonna try and make him a hero there. Um, the fact of the matter is that uh, as I write in the book, Wallace had many flaws. Um, so too did um, Roosevelt, and the the Japanese internment is just one example of those many many flaws. What's striking uh, about Wallace, though, and, and one of the things that that I see as his great strength uh, was his ability to recognize when he was wrong. And uh, in the immediate aftermath of World War II, he was harshly critical of the internments, and frankly, critical of a lot of the other things. Uh, that the, the other failures and missteps and half steps. And so uh, Wallace was a, a constantly evolving political figure. Uh, and he did evolve uh, toward uh, a critique of uh, not just the Democratic Party, but frankly, of even the New Deal. While he loved the New Deal, um, it was its energy and its vision and its desire to solve problems, uh, not its compromises. And so he would talk about that quite often, and, and I think that's actually a good framing for the rest of the book because um, one of the things that, that I try to talk about is that political parties do evolve. They get better at times, but they also get worse. And um, you know, the great struggle for the soul of the Democratic Party is, is really a struggle between forces that seek to get the Democratic Party to be uh, what it often says it wants to be uh, rather than just a, a political operation. You talk in the book about the the popular front approach, you know, Wallace's uh, 1948 campaign in particular, you know, working with communists, even though it was in the middle of the Red Scare, working with uh, labor activists, working with uh, people of all uh, races. And um, this time around, we saw following the uh, elections in 2020, a lot of Fact, factions in the Democratic Party were vilifying other factions in the Democratic Party for uh, yeah. being too socialist or too uh, too progressive. Talk, talk about the Democratic Party of today and what lessons it can learn from Henry Wallace. Well, it's it's less a lesson from Wallace than from FDR, and um, and FDR's great genius was to build the what was called the New Deal coalition. It it was so large, so uh, all encompassing that it included, as I write in the book, um, socialists and, and corporate CEOs. It included bankers and it included uh, communists. It included uh, segregationists, vicious segregationists, and it included civil rights campaigners. It was, in some senses, perhaps too big a coalition, right? There was this effort to to find a place for everyone, uh, but it did produce uh, four successful Democratic campaigns for the presidency, and through that entire period, they held control of the Congress. And that coalition, uh, at least um, under FDR, moved to the left during the course of his presidency, uh, particularly after he brought Wallace in as his vice president in 1940. Bringing Wallace in was an effort to move the coalition further to the left, and there's a good argument to be made that had Roosevelt lived um, and lived through and been able to pursue his agenda in his fourth term, the term that he was elected to shortly before his death, um, that you might well have seen uh, a renewal of the New Deal with a much heavier emphasis on addressing racism and sexism. That was clearly what Wallace wanted to do. Um, that caused tremendous fear on the part of the segregationists, the corporatists, the kind of big city machine bosses. That's why they forced him off the ticket in 1944. Uh, they did not want him to succeed to the presidency if Roosevelt died. And there was a fear because Roosevelt was ailing physically that that might occur. And, and so the great question we ask ourselves is, um, you know, how, what it might've been if Wallace had, had survived. And I think the answer is a much more progressive party, a much more progressive post-war uh, vision. And in many senses, that's been the great struggle ever since. There is a struggle between um, a, a portion of the Democratic Party 
that is far too deferent to Wall Street, far too deferent to corporate power, far too deferent to a neoliberal vision that compromises rather than goes big. Uh, on the other side, you have those who do uh, genuinely want to move in a rapid and, and focused way on behalf of economic and social and racial justice, saving the planet and peace. And the interesting thing is that uh, those who seek to compromise, even today, will say, well, you just can't go too far. You can't you know, put out that big, bold vision because it's, it's too much. It will, it will scare people away. And they, they suggested that even in 2020, that mentions of socialism, mentions of defunding the police, mentions of Medicare for all, mentions of the Green New Deal, were somehow damaging to the Democratic Party. Uh, but I would argue very differently. And in fact, I do argue in the book on this regard. If you look at where the Democratic Party has compromised, where it has moved to the center or even toward more conservative stances on economic and social issues, there's not a history of it doing better. Um, in fact, uh, Harry Truman, who displaced uh, Wallace and became uh, president of the United States in after the death of, of Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman moved the Democratic Party toward much more cautious, much more centrist approaches and lost his governing majorities in the 1946 election. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look, bring it up to more contemporary era, uh, Jimmy Carter elected with great majorities in 1976 in the House and the Senate, uh, ran a more compromising, more cautious presidency, didn't go big on many of the issues that he had promised to address. 1978 uh, suffered serious losses in, um, in the House and the Senate, and in 1980 lost the presidency and the Senate. Uh, Bill Clinton, elected with strong Democratic majorities in the House and the Senate, uh, chose to embrace a neoliberal approach on trade policy, particularly NAFTA, GATT, WTO, also a complicated and cautious approach on health care reform. In 1994, he lost his governing majorities. Uh, Barack Obama, elected with overwhelming majorities in the House and Senate in 2008, governed uh, in, I think, better than Clinton, but in a, in still in a relatively cautious way, particularly as regards uh, an economic downturn at that time, a stimulus that was constrained rather than as aggressive as needed to be, a health care reform plan that did not have a public option that compromised on so many fronts, even though I will uh, acknowledge that I think the Affordable Care Act has done some good and, and is certainly worth uh, fighting for, but not uh, as an end in itself, actually, as, as a, ideally a stepping stone toward Medicare for all. But again, um, compromises, a more cautious approach. And in 2010, uh, Obama lost his uh, governing majority um, and had suffered a series of setbacks politically uh, in, again, in 2014. So my argument is, and it's an argument I make in the book, is that when Democrats get power, instead of deferring to um, the more cautious, more neoliberal, more corporate wing, it really should uh, err on the side or move toward the side of its, its younger, more aggressive, more populist, more progressive uh, forces seeking, again, that economic and social and racial justice agenda. And I think right now this brings us up to the current moment because um, that's the struggle that we're seeing uh, literally as we speak over the soul of the Democratic Party. Right. You know, it's interesting. There's been so many people that have talked about how, you know, even though uh, Joe Biden won the presidency by more votes than. Uh, uh, yes, I've any, written about it a lot. Yes. Yeah. Um, the fact that the uh, the the rest of the ticket, the down ballot ticket didn't do so well, people are saying. And I actually take a different position on that, which is in the races where there were progressive incumbents running, they won. You know, the, the, the House, the, all the progressive members of the House got reelected. Similarly, in ballot initiatives across the country, the school funding referenda, the uh, marijuana legalization and so on, those won. So the, the places where people took a progressive stand, it was rewarded with victory in that election, even though, um, you know, maybe the, the sweep of the down ballot seats wasn't what people had hoped for. Well, I think there's a there's I agree with you, Norman. I think there's a little more to it there. Uh, you, know, you can look in specific states at, at the example. You know, one of the heartbreaking things for Democrats in, in uh, 2020 was the, the relatively substantial loss of the state of Florida, which is considered a real battleground 
Um, and but in the same day that that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris lost the state of Florida uh, by again a pretty substantial margin, uh, Floridians voted overwhelmingly for a fifteen dollar minimum wage. Right. Um, and you know this is the same state that in uh, two thousand eighteen. Uh, voted for some of the most meaningful criminal justice reforms uh, that that we've seen win at the ballot, and including uh, an effort to extend the franchise to people uh, who referred to as so-called ex-felons or, or folks who have who have served their time uh, but are still um, not had still not been allowed to to cast ballots to participate in the political process. So we see at the at the ballot box that the ideas win but often the Democratic Party does not. And so you have to ask yourself, is it really that um, bold and more radical ideas are a burden to the Democrats, or is the real burden the fact that the Democratic Party doesn't stand up and fight hard for them and have a coherent vision about who and what it's gonna be? That was the strength of the New Deal. And for all of its failures, and the New Deal had its failures, I, I don't deny that for a second. But the strength of the New Deal was a sense that wherever you went in America, you understood that the, if you voted Democratic, you were probably going to get um, initiatives to create jobs, to uh, ex provide housing, to address the agricultural crisis or the, the loss of farms, et cetera. That there was a pretty clear vision that, um, that the Democrats were in favor of a, a set of bold initiatives. Now, Wallace wanted to extend that uh, to have the Democratic Party be much more committed to addressing racism and much more committed to addressing sexism. These were two core things that he talked about a great deal. Also, frankly, to addressing the deep class divides and monopolies. Um, and so there was, as part of that broader New Deal vision, there was this, uh, this sense that you could take on big power and big challenges and get something done. I think people still long for that. And uh, frankly, I think Donald Trump exploited that desire um, by promising the world, but frankly, delivering um, only racism, xenophobia, divisiveness, and as he continues to do. And so the Democratic Party has to think about how does it counter this most effectively? Do you counter it by going toward the center? Do you counter it by going soft and hoping to win narrowly or win on the margins? Or do you go big? And, and my argument with the book is that ultimately in this fight for the soul of the Democratic Party, the wiser argument is to go big. You talked about the, um, the, 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 what, the question of what would have happened if Harry Truman had not become the vice president, if Henry Wallace had, uh, had prevailed in, the, uh, in, in Chicago in that uh, uh, convention fight. Uh, by and, the way, it's a great story, the story of that convention fight, yeah. which we because of our tech difficulties, I didn't spend much time talking about, but it really is the, the ultimate smoke filled room, uh, you know, kind of classic battle and Wallace almost won. So sorry to, to interrupt there. But. No, no, no. I was just gonna say that that story, of course, is also told by um, Oliver Stone and Peter Kuznick in their 2009 Perfect. book, uh, The Untold History of the United States, which is also available in the film version. And they really spend a lot of time talking about what would America have been like if Henry mm -hmm. Wallace had had prevailed and had become the president. Well, I guess the question for us today is we're sort of in some ways in a Roosevelt moment right now in this country, we've got huge economic um, crisis, a huge health crisis. We've got a wider class divide than we've seen in, uh, in decades and decades in this, maybe a century now in this country. And, um, you know, what are the possibilities for change in this new Democratic Party that we have uh, in 2020 that has just taken the White House that may or may not uh, get the Senate in uh, a few weeks? Uh, what's the possibility for um, the Democratic Party? Well, the possibility um, is great, uh, but it could also go very much awry as it has in the past. And, and so... Um, look, this is why you fight. This is why there is a fight for the soul of the Democratic Party. And the notion that that there is one uh, coherent democratic vision uh, is just false. It's not the case. There are, There's an ongoing battle. The good news is that uh, the Bernie Sanders campaigns of 2016 and 2020 inspired a, a new generation of folks to come in 
and you really have seen the rise of, of a different and and I think bolder politics within the party, particularly on its left. And this is uh, exemplified by uh, AOC and Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib and Ayanna Presley and uh, you know, Ro Khanna and some longer term uh, members, uh, Barbara Lee and Mark Pocan from here in, in Wisconsin. Uh, and but also people that'll come in into this next Congress, people like Cory Bush and Jamal Bowman, both of whom beat Democratic incumbents in primaries. So you see this, this force that is coming into the party and seeking you know, to really move it toward a more progressive place. Uh, one hopes that they're listened to and one hopes that they're heard, uh, but there is also a, a, a heavy duty push for a more centrist, more cautious approach. Now, I will tell you that uh, this is not about what people want or what people desire. It's not part of about, you know, so much competing visions anymore. It's really about necessity. The fact of the matter is that at this point in our history, the Democratic Party needs to be a party that is in favor of big, bold, fundamental, structural change. Uh, COVID-19, uh, the mass unemployment that extends from it, the unmet demand for racial justice in this country, the climate crisis that becomes more profound on a, on a daily basis, the failure of priorities that has, gives us budgets that fund the Pentagon but don't fund basic human needs, food, shelter, et cetera, uh, health care. This, is, this, can't, this can't go on, right? You cannot let this uh, continue to be the case. So Democrats in power have to do everything they can to address that. If they don't, if Democrats do not govern boldly, and I know it's hard with Mitch McConnell and the Republicans, it may be overwhelmingly hard, but if they don't govern boldly and speak boldly, if they don't use the bully pulpit and executive orders and every tool that they have in their hands, immediately in this crisis moment, because remember, we have a pandemic that is not dealt with. We are not meeting in person because of that. We have unemployment that is rising. We have dislocation in business that is very, very real and in our, our agricultural sector that is very, very real. These are fundamental challenges. So too is our, our incredible uh, overlay of systemic racism in education, healthcare, economics in so many areas that has to be addressed. So too is the climate crisis that has to be addressed. If that does not happen, I can guarantee you, guarantee you that in 2022, Democrats will lose their governing majority in the Congress. And in 2024, they will lose the presidency. So um, I, I believe that the way to understand this is necessity, not, not you know, a debate anymore. Uh, those who suggest that caution and compromise are the way to go uh, really are, I think, writing a, uh, a ticket to disaster for the Democratic Party. And so I'm very blunt about that, not uh, simply because these are values that I, I hold or may value or may respect, but also because the history is so very, very clear. That's why I wrote the book. The book really is an argument that um, when the Democratic Party compromises, when it moves away from big and bold and, and aggressive visionary politics, uh, it ultimately is set back. And those setbacks have allowed a Republican Party that's moved increasingly to the right uh, to prevail in elections, which is absurd. It is absurd that Richard Nixon was elected president of the United States. Absolutely absurd. It is absurd that Ronald Reagan was elected president of the United States. Absolutely absurd. It is absurd that George W. Bush was elected president of the United States. Absolutely absurd. It is absurd that Donald Trump was elected president of the United States. Absolutely absurd. And we ought to note that in both 2000 and in 2016, those elections were won by the candidate who lost the popular vote. And so Democrats have to recognize that there's a pattern here. And that pattern has to be challenged. The way to challenge it is to go back, uh, at least to some extent, to a politics that seeks to uh, build the broadest and most powerful coalitions around a set of values that are of the moment. And so you don't go back necessarily just on policies. You don't try to recreate the New Deal as it existed on policy. 
but you do try to recreate that visionary politics, a politics of the moment. And that visionary politics, a politics of the moment, is going to focus on Medicare for all, a Green New Deal, addressing systemic racism in fundamental and deep and necessary ways, and reordering our budget priorities so that we no longer fund a military industrial complex, but we fund the human needs that have gone unmet in the wealthiest country in the world. And of course, one of the things that goes into that is leadership and vision. And one of our um, uh, listeners here asks, who do you envision as the new chair of the uh, DNC? We certainly saw a battle there where um, uh, uh, centrism uh, won out the last time around. Sure, Keith Ellison sought to uh, be the uh, Democratic or DNC chairman following the 2016 disaster. Um, he was rejected for Tom Perez. Uh, Tom Perez uh, has, yeah, you know, look, he's been a mixed bag. Um, but I suspect that his tenure is, is going to end relatively soon. And frankly, the Democratic Party has, uh, you know, it, it has not been as welcoming and as open as it should be, particularly to the progressive forces that are rising. Uh, and so we could, we could relit, relitigate all of that. Uh, but the better, thing, better place to go is the question of who should be the leader of the Democratic Party. And it should be a progressive. It should be somebody with a vision for building the party uh, at the grassroots with a 50-state strategy. I would love it if Stacey Abrams wanted to do it uh, because the fact of the matter is what she did in Georgia uh, with uh, her her organization and her coalitions with others has been epic and and profound. And look, they flipped Georgia. That's incredible. I can't have Stacey Abrams, uh, who I think is, by the way, going to run for governor of Georgia. So I think she's got a different mission that she's on. Uh, I'd take Ben Wickler, uh, who flipped Wisconsin and and did, uh, I think, a tremendous job. And I think Ben gets a lot of credit for recognizing the need to build uh, coalitions that are rooted in uh, an economic and social and racial justice vision. And also, uh, frankly, for building a party that that uh, respects the, the whole of Wisconsin. Uh, and so Ben, you know, I think Ben would be a, a great choice. Unfortunately, I'm not sure I'll get my choice. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily imagine that. But I will tell you that the Democratic Party needs to change. Uh, it cannot be satisfied, cannot be satisfied simply by taking the presidency and by holding the House by the narrowest of margins and maybe or maybe not getting the Senate. Um, that's not governing power. Governing power is you seek to have the presidency and big, bold majorities in the House and the Senate, and you seek to bring that down into the states, at the state houses and the state legislatures. I mean, there has to be a vision, vision again, a 50-state strategy that sees the Democratic Party as something that is that you build out, that you make profound, that you make uh, necessary in our time. And that can be done. That's certainly within the realm of possibility. But uh, I do worry about it. I worry that uh, caution and compromise might again be asserted. And I think that's very dangerous. Mm-hmm. Well, again, the book is uh, The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party, The Enduring Legacy of Henry Wallace's Anti-Fascist, Anti-Racist Politics. John Nichols, uh, I, I wanna thank you so much. I wanna, I wanna be respectful of, of your time, John, and, and also of all of our viewers, but thanks everybody for hanging through for the uh, technical difficulties. Um, I, I do wanna encourage you to go to roomofonesown.com, the bookstore where you can buy a copy of the book, which then uh, John will go down and sign a stack of them when they're, uh, when they're all assembled there. And uh, also please uh, support the Progressive Magazine. Uh, you can subscribe, you can also uh, make a donation. We are a 501c3, so it's tax deductible. This is our annual campaign that we're in the midst of right now so it's a it's a good time you can go to progressive.org slash donate and support uh this kind of event and future events and uh uh, give john a place to uh keep writing as well can i norm can i offer one final thought here before we take off and and we've got so i'm just thrilled by uh folks who've hung on through this conversation i know we had some challenges up front uh but I tremendously value Norm for, for putting this together and for you know persevering. This is this is classic Norm Stockwell. 
uh, you have some technical challenges and you persevere through them and you get it together and it turns out actually very well. And so I want to thank Norm. Uh, I want to thank the Progressive, which I value as a as a Madison and a Wisconsin institution that is so very important and needs to be supported. Uh, if you can, you know, give a small check uh, or maybe even a large one to support the Progressive, that's really vital and necessary. But finally, let me close off with a a thank you to a room of one's own and a a, a deep, hopefully profound message that independent booksellers are much more than just a store, much more than just a business. Independent booksellers are the place where we come to share ideas and values. And, and frankly, they can be refuges, refuges uh, for people in, in very difficult times. We need to save our independent booksellers. We need to strengthen them. And so uh, if you are you know, in this holiday season, whichever holiday you may choose to, to uh, celebrate, um, you're looking to buy things, I passionately urge you uh, to you know, find a way to buy a few things from a room of one's own. Uh, you can buy my book. I'm delighted. It makes a fine holiday gift. Uh, but if by some chance you're looking for something else, a room of one's own is stocked with just an incredible selection of books, used books and new books, wonderful children's section. I keep talking this bookstore up because I don't ever want to lose it. I want it to go from strength to strength. And so I, I hope people will support it. One of the things we've been doing with this book is is a virtual tour of bookstores around the country. We've done things with City Lights in San Francisco and with you know small bookstores all over the country, even out on the tip of Long Island recently. And I'm so glad to be home in Madison with uh, a bookstore that I truly value, A Room of One's Own. So thanks, Norm, for putting this together. And thanks to A Room of One's Own. I hope you'll support it. Uh, and thanks to everyone who joined us. Thank you all very much again for uh, for coming out and hanging with us through the technical difficulties. And uh, this uh, conversation will be archived and put up on YouTube for uh, future viewing. So please uh, share the link with your friends. And uh, again, visit progressive.org on the web for lots of great content and uh, lots of uh, important information. Thanks so much.